I've decided to write a manifesto. You can decide for yourself how serious it's intended to be. <laughs> I don't know. I I feel like I need to have like the less extreme ideas first that like wean you into the total nonsense. In my idealized society, eugenics exists. We call it sex within marriage. There's no premarital sex. You choose who it is that you want to have children with. And one could say that that's a form of genetics or selective breeding, just on the individual level, on the individual basis, which is obviously not something very controversial. It's not entirely realistic because people are whores. It occurred to me one day that sex within the confines of marriage is, in a sense, a form of eugenics, and that's kind of good clickbait. That makes people think, <gasps> When you're like, no, I'm just describing something that has been an ideal through a lot of history. Next point. Oh, I need to be writing that down. Eugenics. <laughs> no premier, no premarital sex. Next point. Abolish prisons. There are no prisons. There's either reform, execution, or Australia where we send them to an island, abolish prison. When I say reform, it's like, you know, whatever it is that you stole or whatever damages, you are effectively indebted to that person to pay that back. Probably what I'm describing to only works in a kind of a small society. It probably can't be scaled up to the size of a city. So then cities don't exist in my manifesto world. Horseshoe theory racism. Whites and blacks against the browns. <laughs> That's one of those joke ones. It's, mo it's meant to sound really transgressive, but it's mostly a joke. Horseshoe, theory of racism, blacks and whites versus browns. Uh, in reality, I don't want any sort of racial conflict, but hey, it's a funny thing to joke about. If you joke about it, you get a lot of friends. Everyone thinks racial jokes are funny. In a way, you kind of would think that the blacks and the whites would ally. It's like, hey, we're both on the extremes. <laughs> now I'm, how did I go from turning this thing into a joke into like now I'm somewhat unironically presenting an argument? Let's not go down that road. The foundation of education is survivalism. Survivalism is taught first thing in elementary school. Kids are taught how to build shelters, how to start fires. That is the building block that everything else then expands from. First survivalism, then calisthenics, then electricity. That's not to say that you'd neglect things like math or English, but uh, I basically contend that that's not really being taught anyway. What if uh, in high school PE, if instead of like playing badminton, and weird crappy sports where like you're bouncing a ball and trying to get it into a hoop. Like sports are so weird and artificial. What if instead you had a regimented calisthenics program? At one point they taught us how to lift weights. We did circuit training for like a month. What if over the span of say three years, you effectively went through some kind of like gymnastic-esque calisthenic program? People would be so much healthier to have that sort of foundation. Where were we? Calisthenics, survivalism, electricity. Next in my manifesto, we reintroduce child labor or we pay kids for doing their homework. That was an issue I always had in school was I was like, wait a second. So the teacher gets paid to be here. I'm sitting here in school because I'm a child slave. I have to be here. All the adults are telling me that I have to be here. I have to sit here for whatever it is, six hours, however long you're in school for. Um, I have so much strength and so much energy, especially by the time I was like 16 years old. And I would just like running up walls, doing flips and climbing things. And I was at probably the peak of energy that I would ever have in my life. And um, all the adults were telling me that I just needed to sit in a chair. 
and learn about how like chemicals bond and whatever stupid crap. The teachers are getting paid for that, but then after that, I'm expected to go home and continue my work, continue working for free at home. That was always a joke to me. You felt the same, it's why you refused to do homework. Work should be within work hours only. Well, that was my, that was my rule for school, was that if I couldn't do it in class, I wouldn't do it at home. And I was an average student. I'd usually hover around 80% or so. And there would be some classes where I would just totally start to fall behind. And then I would, if I ever felt like I was gonna fail the class, then I would do a homework assignment and my mark would get bumped up. It's very poor boundaries. <laughs> it's, it's poor boundaries is what it is. And it's like, as a kid, I had some sort of innate sense that I can actually be productive. And so why am I expected to do this for nothing? Yeah, by the time I was in high school, I just started working at the hardware store. And I wouldn't do my homework because I would be busy spending 30 hours a week after school working at the hardware store and making actual money. Anyway, I don't want to make the, that a big spiel about my experiences in education, but uh, we reintroduce child labor. So I'm not saying that school and homework isn't valuable. Kids need to learn things. We need to also instill in them a sense that what they're doing is actually useful and productive and valuable. It's not in this fake imaginary world where they're just laboring for no reason. And we're kind of like conditioning them to feel indebted to this weird system. When I traveled, I would, I'd like be in Nepal and I would stop off on my motorcycle and get a bit of food somewhere. Picture like kind of like someone's house, but they effectively have almost like a garage and that acts as a bit of a restaurant. I would go there and I would get my menu and I'd order food and there would be this little like whatever nine-year-old kid. A lot of times they look younger than they are out there. Um, but say there's like a nine-year-old kid takes my order and then goes into the back and makes my food, gives me my food receives my payment and I would have these moments where I would just be like, okay, so this kid is basically like the manager of a restaurant at nine years old. And I know it's not like hectic or busy or whatever, but they understand the, the sort of like principles. I, I think kids should just work, you know? I was saying I was doing some, uh, I was building like forts and stuff with my nephew and niece. They're pretty young, but my nephew is at a stage now where he is like, he's strong enough that his work is productive. Um, if we're shoveling things, if we're digging things and, you know, when they're really little and you're trying to get something done and they're just around and they're kind of getting in the way, but you, you tolerate it because the point of the whole thing is for you guys to be hanging out. That's the point of the activity. It's just the other thing is secondary. Well, now he's at a point where no, he's actually like productive. It's just stupid to me that he's in some sort of position where it's like, he's not allowed to work because he's young. It's dumb. So yeah, child, we reintroduce child labor. That's the next part of the manifesto. And that doesn't mean that we're like sending six-year-olds into coal mines. Like we're kind of, we kind of couldn't end up back there even if we tried. When people hear child labor, they automatically jump into like, oh, child abuse. It's like, well, no, we already tell kids they have to work. Just now we're not making them like slaves working for free. Um, next we have in the manifesto, in my idealized society, there are highly trained death squads that go around killing people. I just wanted to say that statement and then re reverse engineer what that would actually be. The only thing I could come up with was in the very rare event, I understand this basically doesn't happen, but um, in the very rare event that there is an abortion required in order to save the life of the mother, doctors are allowed to perform that. Otherwise, we're not in favor of abortion, but in that very rare case, there are highly trained death squads that exist in order to perform those specific abortive medical procedures. Also, if, um, if we've abolished prisons because there's only reform, execution, or Australia, I guess that is why we have highly trained death squads as well. All right, next we have, for every person who is on welfare, there is a social worker who has to be homeless. Maybe there's a ratio. Maybe there's kind of like a span of control where for every six people that are on welfare, there's one homeless social worker. The reason for that is because when I used to work in the social work field, you would always hear that society wasn't generous enough to homeless people or for the marginalized. And I was like thinking to myself, 
so much resources go into this neighborhood and it's not fixing anything. The pro I was like, the problem isn't that the public doesn't care about the homeless. The public obviously does. Part of the problem is that uh, the homeless treat the rest of the public like they're ATMs. And in their minds, they think that, well, I'm only taking like a penny from everyone and society has wronged me and I deserve this. They would feel completely morally justified to be on welfare and there would be literally zero incentive for them to, to get off of welfare and they just stay on it forever. Then I thought that part of the reason that that's not a good thing is because they're disconnected from the, from the repercussions of the sort of like social costs of what it is that they're getting from everyone else. And there needs to be a person who manifests that. And who better than the social worker? Because I actually discovered that social workers actually have a very easy job. <laughs> I shouldn't. Uh, that's, that's me being a little bit provocative. Um, you know, I worked in environments where people would get threatened and attacked. And, you know, I've been like bitten and stuff by people who are losing their minds. And it isn't, it isn't the same as most jobs. But... What social workers tend to do, and I know that social worker is like a very distinct classification. I'm kind of speaking about something more broadly than that. They, they do have a difficult job. They're dealing with very difficult people, but they get paid to do that, just like everyone else gets paid to do their job. So when I was working in the construction field, when I was doing electrical, I was also dealing with very difficult people who were also like nuts. <laughs> Um, and we were dealing with like dangerous tools and it was also very dangerous and you had to put up with so much. That's sort of just like a part of work. Not everyone gets to have this totally harmonious relationship with their coworkers and the public and everything. Um, so social workers like to really exaggerate how difficult their job is in that regard. And they like to pretend that that's not what the rest of the public faces as well. Um, and in addition to their wages, they also sit there and pat themselves on the back because they're so compassionate and they're so generous and they help homeless people. And I would argue that in many cases, they are not. They're not helping anyone. I'm not saying that social services shouldn't exist at all. There should, there should be some form, assuming that the public is actually in agreement with it and not being extorted into providing these services against their will without any sort of representation or vote. Uh, like what we saw with the safe injection site in Vancouver, where the Supreme Court just decided that that was suddenly now legal and no one got to have any sort of say in it, even though everyone else had to pay for it. So yeah, they just, they pat themselves on the back and pretend that they, they get this social kudos for being such wonderful people because they're working with the homeless. And it's like, yeah, you have a regular job. You, you work a job just like everyone else, um, except for you wouldn't survive in any sort of free market. Like the public is forced to fund what it is that you're doing. Charity is better. These things should be left to the religious institutions. To get back to my original point. So for every homeless person, there is a social worker who is homeless. Because a lot of these social workers, they actually have no bearing on what the working world, what reality is actually like. So they sit there behind these desks and they give marginalized people training and education and they help them with their resumes and they give them all this advice on how to get a job and how to be a functioning member of society even though the social worker if it weren't for their job they too would just be a random homeless person and if you were to throw them into a lot of other work environments like construction like anything that's sort of like free market expected to be productive a lot of them just wouldn't hack it. They wouldn't cut it. They're social workers because there's no expectation of merit. Ooh, did I say some spicy things there? I kind of feel like I did. I know I'm very much disparaging the field. I don't want it to sound as brutal as I'm making it, but there is a degree of, there's a large degree of truth in what I'm saying there. And I do have a respect for a lot of these people, but there is a culture in that environment that is awful. The social workers should be homeless. And anytime someone is on welfare, they should have to meet with the social worker who is homeless effectively on their behalf. It's like some sort of exchange has occurred. The social worker becomes the manifestation of the social cost in their life. And that doesn't mean that it needs to be like sketchy or weird or bad. Part of the problem with being homeless is that the type of people who are homeless 
tend to be not the most high functioning people. For them, being homeless is actually very dangerous. And there's all sorts of drug addiction and all sorts of other mental health issues, things that make being homeless very challenging. For a lot of other people, being homeless isn't that great a challenge. I lived in a van for a year. It was awesome. I had the highest quality of life I've ever had <laughs> when I lived in my van. Um, contrary to when I live inside of a stupid house and I'm like not connected with nature and um, I can stay up until 2 a.m. because the lights are able to stay on instead of being a little bird that as soon as you put the curtain over top of the um, cage, you just fall asleep, which is what happens when you're out when you're outside. I was in Spain at one point and there were these people protesting. This was in Barcelona or Barcelona, if you're fancy. There are people protesting. They just made this tree village. They just lived in the trees. And these were like basically normal college students. And it just seemed so cool. It was so awesome. I was so jealous. And they did, they did this in one of like the main uh, town square areas or something. But they had a good thing going. And I was like, man, this should be the, so <laughs> this should be the social workers. And you could set it up in a way that's safe. You could set it up in a way where they're effectively like they're going to have an ear to the street in a way that would be very unique. They could collaborate with the larger system, with the police. We could actually ensure that the streets were safer if social workers were homeless instead of the homeless. I really think this is something that's not a joke. I really think I'm onto something. And also, Less people would want to be social workers and the social industrial complex would stop growing. And maybe it's something that you only have to do for like four years as a social worker. And then you kind of reach like some sort of management position and, you know, but you have to go through your period of service. There's also that idea where you would have to serve in order to be able to vote. Some pretty good arguments there. Maybe that would be another position. What have we done so far? We did uh, eugenics which is no premarital sex. We did abolish prisons. There's reform, execution, or Australia. We did horseshoe theory racism, which is uh, blacks and whites versus browns. Joking. The thing is, though, is that no one thinks that, like, really black people are ever going to go extinct. But you know the, like, super, super dark, like, Nigerian people or whatever who are, like, they're not just black, they're, like, super black. All I'm saying is that, like, the head nod, the head nod, of like, hey, we all, <laughs> yeah, super black. Because, you know, you go to Africa and they fight, even though everyone, even though we would say that everyone's black, that doesn't mean that they don't fight over different shades of black over there. All of this stuff is relative. And that's why it's such a joke. And that's why I make jokes about it. Um, we went over survivalism as the foundation of education, followed by calisthenics and electricity. <laughs> Uh, we went over reintroducing child labor or paying kids for homework. We went over highly trained death squads that exist and for every person on welfare, social workers, homeless. Our next thing is the Attack on Titan opening four is the national anthem. That is the song Rumbling. <laughs> Rumbling is the national anthem because um, let's stop pretending that Canada is even still a country. Oh, that hurts to say. The spirit of Canada still exists because people still believe in it. There is still like Canadian patriotism. And I mean what Canada like was. Um, but in practice, in function, on a sort of bureaucratic level, in terms of what it is that the government is, the government is anti-Canadian. And if you want evidence for that, I mean, if you have Trudeau saying things like Canada is a post-nation state, if you have the government violating the charter, if you have the government acting like nationalism is some sort of national security threat then it's like oh so you just like don't believe in countries and therefore when you mean canada you just mean like a province of the world economic forum okay just say that next we have fault divorce exists it's like losing a passport you get punished for getting divorced and your bridal party effectively has to sign off on it it's not just between the two of you. Your community has a say. And uh, if you don't want that sort of agreement, you need to be very selective in who your bridal party is. Fault, divorce, exists. 
weddings are like this big party where everyone is celebrating everything. Everyone's so happy. People want to basically invite themselves. And there's always this pressure to invite the great aunt or whatever. That's I shouldn't say that. I actually really like my great aunt. I'm not talking about anyone specific, but there's always some sort of pressure for to bring some relative in that like you've never met or the, the parent's friend of a friend. And it's just this weird political thing. Everyone wants to be at weddings. And it's this big celebration. But then when it comes to divorces, no one's around for the divorces. Divorces are like two people in a room signing paperwork alone. You juxtapose that to the big community celebration. It's not right. The community needs to be just involved in the divorce. It's not to say you have a big party celebrating your divorce, but there needs to be some sort of like official recognition that this thing is being disbanded. And depending on the, and there needs to be like a reason. It's like if someone's cheated, you establish that. You establish what happened. The community effectively knows. And it's not to say that there's not forgiveness and that people don't understand. Everyone's fallible. Everyone screws up. But gone are the days where this is just some insignificant legal acknowledgement that people basically accidentally enter into by way of common law. The next part of my manifesto is Jews. I don't have anything to say about Jews at all. <laughs> I just thought that you can't have a manifesto without including the word Jews. And uh, people are going to interpret that all sorts of different ways. Uh, <laughs> so Jews exist in the manifesto. Oh, every journalist has to fight Alex Jones in order to get press credentials. Alex Jones is a lot in a lot of trouble right now because he got the events of Sandy Hook wrong. Allegedly. <laughs> No, I, I don't really have a strong opinion about that. All I can say is I was discovering 4chan around the time that that happened, like the Sandy Hook thing happened. And uh, let's just say it was a very confusing time. I remember listening to the police scanners and um, the police certainly didn't know what was going on. I can understand why some people disagreed with the official narrative. That's completely reasonable to me. That's not the same thing as calling for people to harass the parents of dead kids. If Alex Jones said, hey, harass these people because they're crisis actors, then sure, maybe he should face some sort of consequence for that. Uh, but basically, so should like CNN, you know. And they got a bit of their comeuppance with Nicholas Sandman. The news goes around and says that, oh, there's like weapons of mass destruction and uh, like a million Middle Eastern people die and no one receives any punishment for that, even though they're like wrong. I think the focus on Sandy Hook is kept fresh in people's mind because we still don't know what happened in Vegas. Exactly. Yeah. If the government doesn't want people to come up with crazy ideas, they need to be more forthcoming about the official narrative. Um, yeah, all the government needs to do is just be more honest with us and then uh, maybe there'll be less zany conspiracies. But you want to know my super tinfoil hat idea is that the conspiracies themselves are honeypots. They're conspiracies. The real conspiracy is that a lot of conspiracies are created by intelligence agencies in order to identify and discredit it's a trap. It's a red herring. There's what actually happened. And then there's the official narrative, which is like, you know, maybe a few degrees out or maybe very far out from it. Like whatever, the JFK assassination or something. It's like the truth doesn't line up with what the narrative is. Now, a way that you can prevent people from getting to the truth is you just, you clutter it with so much misinformation that it gets so confusing that then... It, again, it's it's about like the contrast or it's about relativity. So if you have all these crazy ideas, the official narrative starts to seem a lot more reasonable because when you compare those crazy things to the official narrative, that's not so bad. But if you're comparing the official narrative to the truth, the official narrative doesn't make sense. But they just need to get people's attention away from the truth. So all these really juicy like, oh, they, you know, all of the, I'm not going to, I'm not going to start to explain what the 
ideas were around Sandy Hook. Yeah, the, the real conspiracy is that the intelligence agencies basically fake conspiracies. Not all of them. I faked my own. I faked my own, like the Pope is a robot. The greatest problem since antiquity was that machines were bulky and took up too much space to be convincing. To make up for this, extreme measures were taken. A unique bloodline of men were selectively bred to be small enough to fit into robotically enhanced robes. In addition to this, the robes were made unusually grandiose and superfluous to hide the many gears and machinations of the robotically enhanced super popes. Why else would the Pope have such a large hat? To hide the gears. Anyway, so that was a bit of a tangent. We were talking about, you need to be able to fight Alex Jones for press credentials. Maybe that's actual, maybe you get to choose hand-to-hand -hand combat or it's like a battle of your record. You know, things that Alex Jones has been right about versus things that they've been right about. Here's where it gets a little bit goofy. Anyone of healthy body has to live in trees like Ewoks in order to preserve natural growth. So we live in tree forts. Everyone lives in tree forts except for the, like, the elderly and the disabled. Uh, maybe we gotta figure something out for kids because you don't want kids to fall. But basically, like, we live in trees. Here's the problem with tree forts. As someone who's built my share of tree forts, the problem is that the trees move and grow and change. Eventually, what you built the tree fort for, it's not as well suited for the growth of the tree. And things start to kind of bend a little bit and get a little bit weird. And what that means is that houses and structures would be less permanent. Now, a lot of people would say that's a really bad thing, you know? The ultimate goal is to have a house that survives longer than you. You know, you don't want to have to replace your roof every year or whatever, right? I'm kind of on the other side of the fence from that. I think that maybe we need to have a, we need to move away from this idea of permanence. And maybe it's a good thing that every year or so you have to really seriously look at your, where you live and reevaluate whether it's safe. And basically everyone would become like carpenters to a degree. Everyone would have a, a level of engineering inherently built into them. And yes, it would come at a bit of a cost. There would be the odd hurricane that would destroy a family. But who's to say that you wouldn't produce a safer and healthier society? You know, when I do parkour, a lot of the things that I do are very dangerous. And I ride a motorcycle a lot. And part of the reason I engage in dangerous activities is because it makes me a sharper person. I pay closer attention. I have a greater capacity to engage with risk and dangers. For me to go jump to some sort of bar or do something at height or do something, in many respects, that's safer than the person who is so out of shape, they go to walk up a set of stairs and they fall and they can't navigate like basic stuff because they're not really paying attention and <clears throat> At the end of the day, they can't flip into that mental space where they can conquer something that's serious, something that has stakes. And that's really what the problem is, is that people have been so like infantilized that they can't handle things that have very real consequence. You know, I remember when I was in high school and I would, whatever, I would, I would go to this parkade near the mall and at the third story, I would hang off of this bar off of one arm, like, and just look down, three stories down. And I would just bask and soak in the realization that my life is in my hands. Like, literally, whether or not I die is dependent on whether I can hold on to this thing. And I'm not saying everyone needs to do that. That's a little bit extreme and maybe reckless. Those are the kinds of things that young people do. But that was me coming to terms with that. With, with consequences, with stakes, with responsibility, with the cause and effect of my own actions. And we have lost that. We're just making the world safer and safer. We're getting rid of edges and people are getting softer and softer. And that is what is dangerous, is how soft people are getting until you reach a point where everyone can just be gullibly convinced to wear masks and get injected with whatever it is that the government tells them, oh shoot, I shouldn't get the live stream banned or whatever, right? And then a bunch of people die from that. You can either make the world safer or you can make yourself stronger and sharper. 
And I'm not saying we shouldn't make the world safer at times, but we also need to make ourselves more resilient. And us living in tree forts is like a way that you do that. I remember setting up a hammock really high, high up in trees. I had to climb up this tree. I, I set up a hammock and I slept in the hammock way off the ground. And to go to sleep knowing that your life is contingent on whether or not you could tie good knots, to be laying there staring at the knots that you tied being like, gee, I sure hope those hold. That does something to a person that's good. And it requires proper mentorship. And there's like, there's a way to do these things. We need to teach people how to do these things. And living in the trees is a sort of manifestation of that. You're forced to become a very reliable person. Don't trust a person who can't tie good knots, honestly. Like what that says about them. Here's two things that you need to have. This is like, this would go, this would go in like the survivalism portion of like kindergarten or whatever. Two things. The basics are you have bladed things like knives or machetes or whatever to separate things that need to be split apart. And you have ropes to combine things that need to be joined. The foundation of all things is joining and separating. There's a time for all things time to scatter and a time to gather, right? The flag of our nation should be like a knot and a blade, combining and separating, inclusion and exclusion. Uh, but yeah, don't trust people who can't tie knots and that's why we live in tree forts. Uh, there would be people who are like legitimately like mentally disabled and you know, there would be exceptions. There would be people who can't, who are never going to be able to be that proficient or even just like the elderly, maybe they don't have to live in the trees. Maybe you have like steps and at the bottom, basically on the ground are the people who just like, you know, they need help. That's okay. But generally society lives in trees. Yeah. So we're Ewoks who live in the trees. Uh, gay people have their own civil union and it's called garage or hemorrhage, like marriage, but also homo not to be confused with hemorrhage. Gay marriage doesn't exist. Gays have their own civil union. In exchange, heterosexual marriage can be called boring marriage. Uh, that way the gays won't get jealous again. I think if they want certain legal recognitions, we can, as a society, we can grant that to them. Marriage is something different though. Gay marriage was always about co-opting the term marriage. It wasn't about the civil unions. It was about them saying, uh, you're not special, we're just like you. You're not. You're not. That's not a statement of quality. That's not me saying that I'm better than you for being straight married and not gay married. That's not me. To you, to you, I'm sure that your gay marriage is more valuable to you than my gay, than my, <laughs> than my straight marriage. They don't want to feel left out, so they can have garage and we can have boring marriage. We'll call it boring marriage because we're not so insecure. We don't care. I was gonna say whatever it takes to get you guys to stop hassling us. So uh, straight marriage is boring marriage and gay marriage is uh, gay ridge or hemorrhage. Gay marriage doesn't exist. Gay people have their own civil union. Straight marriage can be called boring marriage. So the gays don't get jealous again. Feminism is punishable by 10 sandwiches per offense. And an offense is whenever her man says it is. Every man must take a life in order to be able to eat meat. Preferably animal life. At age 15, you have to kill an animal or you become a vegetarian. That's the rule. I obviously don't have a problem with eating meat, but I think the real problem is when you are you're divorced or you're so far separated from the, the life that has been taken. When you just consume meat without having any sort of understanding of the cost that that has on nature and the life that you're taking, that is the problem. So, and maybe it's the kind of thing that you do when you're 15 and also every five years. It's like every five years you have to hunt an animal. Otherwise you are a vegetarian. You're not allowed to eat meat.
if you want to just be a vegetarian, that's fine. Just be a vegetarian, right? But you don't get to just eat meat and not know what it costs. Every man must take a life in order to be allowed to eat meat, preferably animal life. At age 15, you kill an animal or become a vegetarian. Or there's degrees, you could be like a piscatarian or whatever. Items made of wool, glass, or wood are not taxed. Everything else is taxed extra. Plastic is mostly outlawed. There's really strong incentives to build out of certain materials. I guess more like organic and less than synthetic materials. Oh, so wool, glass, wood, or metal will not be taxed. All right. Politicians must hang out at pubs and play pool with strangers. Just politicians need to be publicly accessible and in a sort of like organic social way. Like right now, politicians are publicly ac accessible because I can send my local representatives an email that they can then just delete. And then if I want to meet them face to face, I basically would have to like stalk them and catch them at a weird time, which is which is a bad thing or a bad arrangement. I should be able to just hang out at the pub and bump into so-and-so and for that to be like a regular occurrence. Maybe the pubs would have to be in trees too. I haven't decided. There is no fiat currency. Ammo or arrows are sufficient currency. Maybe just regular precious metals. You can't just invent currency out of nowhere is the idea. This is an interesting one. I'm curious about your take on this. Every hundred years, the tech tree starts over. So every hundred years, we just reset all of our technology and we just go back to like primitive technology. Maybe every 50 years, it, maybe it should, it should probably happen every other generation, I think. Books can stay, like we can still retain the knowledge of technology. It's not like we burn all the books and we start completely from ground zero. We can still maintain the intellectual tradition, but basically it's like all the tools and all the material things, we start over. We're like a step above nomads. So every 100 years, the tech tree starts over. Books can stay, but the tools get reforged. <laughs> Unmine the iron, put it back in the ground. You would, you would basically reforge the tools. And in a way, it's a, it's a good opportunity to, well, I guess you would have to make the forges again. I don't know. It wouldn't have to be like so black and white. Uh, there, maybe there could be some parameters around it. Maybe there would be like certain factories that are untouched, that they remain. But every hundred years, everything is like remade. So yeah, tools are reforged. If you had an iron tool, you would melt it down, cast a new one. It would be like the great evaluation. As soon as you start going down the road of exceptions, then it's a messy thing, but maybe there are certain sentimental elements that are accounted for. You have your family's like great, great, great grandpa's ax, and that doesn't get reforged. And there's sort of just like, I don't know, maybe you get a certain allotment of things that you don't have to change because they're like heirloom items. The general idea is that for the most part, everything starts over every hundred years because we said that the, the foundation of education starts with survivalism and then goes to calisthenics and then electricity. Um, this is sort of an extension of that survivalism component because you don't want to have a bunch of generations go by where they're so disconnected with like ground one technology. Basically, everyone should be able to go from rubbing two sticks together to start a fire to being able to uh, charge a battery. You minimize a society where everyone is using these and no one knows how they work. Um, we're like Amish farmers, except for we live in trees. If we live in a biome where there aren't trees, then maybe it's like tunnels or caves or it's water world. So if you live in the desert, maybe you don't get trees, you just get some sort of cave. There needs to be some sort of like direct connection with your environment. Amish farmers who live in trees. This is an important one. The strongest person lives on the highest hill. 
The citizenry should care more about maintaining the integrity of figuring out who the strongest person is than any sort of elections or politics. That's like a kind of a status thing. There is like the strongest man. He lives on the highest mountain. And that's very important. I don't know that he gets any sort of like extra political power, just social clout. But it's, it's worth honoring. It represents like merit. How that would be figured out, I don't know. The strongest person lives on the highest hill. Because politics are basically already fake. Like by nature of what they are, they're shady. It's who knows who, who, you know. But who the strongest man is should be a very empirical thing. It cannot be meddled with. Where politics, there's always going to be some nepotism. There's always going to be favors. And it's like, yeah, it's politics. But the strongest man, that's important. A homeless guy is a political office. So basically, if someone's homeless, they're like automatically politicians. Uh, politicians don't get paid unless they can balance the budget. It's pretty self-explanatory. It is completely laughable and inappropriate that politicians cannot balance budgets when the rest of us are expected to balance our home budgets. If they can't balance a budget, they are not fit for office. That's a very easy thing. And any government that cannot balance a budget, they have lost the moral authority to expect to collect taxes from you because they're incompetent. So um, any, yeah, any politician that can't balance the budget, they don't get paid. And maybe there are punitive measures for them too. Maybe there's certain exceptions if there's like acts of God, you know, if there's like the hurricane that wipes out a bunch of people's houses and there's a lot of damage and it's like, okay, how could we have been expected to prepare for that? And now the costs are like our society's in debt because despite the proficiency of the politicians and the organizing and the planning and everything, we weren't able to account for this. So our society is just going to buckle down and accept that we have a degree of debt. That's acceptable under certain conditions. But um, beyond that, this sort of like normal thing where society is just going deeper and deeper in debt. No, you're like you're a criminal if you're a politician and you're allowing that to happen. You don't get to just plunge society into debt and force everyone else to pay for it. You're a criminal now. Uh, don't get paid unless they can balance the budget. This is a serious one, too. When you're voting, there's an option for the random layperson. And I've always thought this. I've always... Back when I used to vote, <laughs> back when I used to believe in the integrity of the system, now I think that by me engaging in the act of voting, I am um, I'm lending it legitimacy that it doesn't deserve. And I, I find it is actually morally taxing on my conscience to engage with the voting system. If our government decides to honor the charter, I might reevaluate that. But for now, I will not. I would look at the different people who are running and I would be like, I would rather the average person on the street than these people. These aren't the best of society. These are, the, these are on the lower end of society. If there's average, these people are less than average in terms of the quality of their character, or blah, 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 blah. And I would rather just roll the dice and pick a random person off the street and be like, hey, you're the new mayor. Hey, you're the new premier. You're the new, you're the new prime minister. And you could say that what that is, is it's some sort of vote of non-confidence or it's a way for people like myself to express that rather than just spoiling the vote or spoiling the ballot. Um, it's a way of expressing that you don't think any of the options are good. They're less than average and you would rather have a random person, except for you would actually act on it. So you could vote in a random lay person. And I don't know by what mechanism this would be accomplished, maybe some sort of like you have all the citizens on a piece of paper, on papers, and you reach into the thing and pull out the name. I don't know how you would do it, um, especially if your political system is so compromised that you can't trust the people you're voting for anyway, then why would you trust some sort of random system? But in concept, that would be an idea that, you know, and maybe you end up with like, oh, great, the super criminal. We picked a random person and it ended up being the super criminal. Yeah, David agrees with my perspective on voting here, current voting. And I hate where people are like, 
oh, well, you don't get to complain because you didn't vote. It's like, no, I get to complain because I didn't vote. You've built in the idea that voting fixes, fixes these things, whereas I am saying that, no, you voting is the problem. You just granted legitimacy to this thing that's evil, at this point anyway. I get in theory and concept, it's not a bad thing, but when your system is so corrupt that all it is is a mechanism that's subjugating people, then no, we need to walk away from it. What's next? Vehicles are only for resource and supply lines. Otherwise, for the most part, you just work close to your home or close to your tree. Everyone, for the most part, just lives in a tree and grows their own food. And like really all you need is you need uh, safety from the elements and food. Because again, survivalism is the foundation of the society. So if everyone is like, you know, you've got your farm, you're basically a farm with, with like a tree in the middle that you live in, or maybe you're in a forest and there's animals all around, whatever, right? Um, you typically don't have to travel very far anyway. And that's not to say that there aren't shops and stores and stuff. Like maybe in addition to growing your own food, you also specialize in something. You have the blacksmith or whatever, or the guy who builds cell phones. I don't know, you've got the factory. But for the most part, it's just you set things up in a way where people don't have to travel very far. It's like the Amish. The Amish have some cars sometimes, which they use to drive into the city to purchase things. And it's sort of like the, the, the town's vehicle. And maybe there's still things like electric scooters. That's not to say that you can't get around or people can still get around other ways. But by the most part, it's like a pedestrian society. There's not really cars. Um, animal and pedal power not included, right? Yeah, you can have, you can have like carts and you could have bicycles and, and like there would be some cars, but by and large, that's not really a thing. And it's not a thing because it's actually, it makes more sense to be on foot. Like right now with the, you know, the World Economic Forum is now saying that they're trying to get rid of personal vehicles and why that doesn't make sense is because our society is built around driving from place to place. Like good luck, good luck surviving and at least where I live without a vehicle. But in parts of Europe, everyone walks around everywhere. Public transit is pretty good. And so it makes sense out there. It doesn't make sense here. And now if, if you're going to try and restructure our society here, you're, you're taking advantage, you're abusing a lot of people you know, like the Netherlands, where they're just going to, they're just going to take over the farmland and create some sort of big state. Force your community to be very integrated too. And that's of course good. Yeah, I would like to say that you don't have to force your community to. You would hope that everyone would be on the same page and that they would understand. The problem is sort of like, it would very much be like an Amish community. The problem is the next generation where there's always the people who, who are there and they hate the society, but they don't leave. So at a certain point, at a certain age, you, you get to go and have your whatever it's called, where you go explore the big city and you decide whether you want to join the secular society or still be Amish. But if you're going to come back to the civilization, the, the tree, the Ewok civilization, if you're going to come back, it's like you come back because you're on board with our values. And maybe you're not on board with our values. Maybe you don't want to live in a tree. That's fine. You go live in some sort of neighboring city. And every once in a while, you can come in and you can visit us. That's not to say that there isn't social interaction between the different groups. But if you're not on board with what we're doing, leave. Don't live here. And if you're on board with what, you're doing, with what we're doing, well, that means you, you, are, you accept our values. And part of our values is this like kind of a, a primitivist survivalist mentality where we walk around because it's better for you. It makes more sense. And we structure our lives in a way where things aren't really far apart. So you make friends with the people in your immediate surroundings rather than having that friend who's two hours away because as much as you enjoy them, why wouldn't, you, why wouldn't you maintain that with your neighbors? You only have so much time to be social. Random layperson as a voting option. Vehicles 
are only for resource, I should say community. You can't get married unless you build a tree fort for the both of you to live in. That's sort of just your rite of passage. Maybe, sure you can do rings and stuff too, but it's almost like once you're able to build a tree fort for the two of you to live in, you are now resourceful enough to be worthy of marriage, ultimately to be worthy of children. It's you expressing that you're a provider. If you can't provide shelter from the elements, then you're not ready to get married. And Israel actually used to have something like this. Basically, when a couple was getting married, they would, during the engagement, the man would be building the, kind of like the addition to the home. That would be like the engagement process. So there would be a very similar thing. Tree fort for the both of you to live in. And maybe it's something that the couple does together. It doesn't necessarily have to be, that's probably a good project for them to work on together. It doesn't have to be that, oh, it's only the man who builds the tree fort. Uh, when you have children, you plant trees for them. You have the tree that represents each person. Maybe when a person dies, it's like you cremate the ashes beneath their tree. And maybe a tree gets diseased and it lightning strikes it and the person is still alive, but the tree has gone or something like maybe weird things like that happen. And maybe you plant a new tree or something. I don't know. It's a greater way of establishing your connection with nature beyond just living in tree forts. Like right now we have, there's gravestones and there's, there's graveyards and the people who come before us, um, we, we see their tombstone. This is kind of the same thing except for it's a little more optimistic than just a piece of stone that says so-and-so died. It's like they're still, they're still around. The tree is still there. You know, this is grandpa's tree. This is blah, blah, blah. And eventually maybe you reach a point where the, you run out of room because <laughs> there's so many trees. You cross that bridge when you get there. You plant a tree for every child you have. I guess maybe you could get buried under the tree or something. Then you're probably affecting the root structure, but. Oh, here's an interesting one. Anyone who accuses someone else of being phobic has to demonstrate that they have irrational fear or else they are subjected to something terrifying themselves. So I know that to accuse someone of being phobic is like an accusation that they're a bad person, which doesn't make sense because if a person's an arachnophobe or if they're an agoraphobe, or if they're like afraid of heights, whatever that is called, we don't shame those people. And we don't, we don't shame people for being afraid. Except for if they're, like phobia is an accusation of not being accepting. So homophobia, xenophobia, whatever, Islamophobia, that carries with it a moral judgment. Because when someone's an arachnophobe, we, ex we express compassion towards them. If someone is a, um, a homophobe, generally society condemns them. If we actually thought that they were really afraid, irrationally afraid, there would be some compassion there. And if you're gonna accuse someone of being a homophobe or a xenophobe or whatever, because that is an accusation, you have to be able to demonstrate that they have irrational fear. And if you get it wrong, if you can't demonstrate that, you have you have them come around the corner and there's two people kiss two two gay dudes and they're kissing. And if their reaction to that is they kind of don't care, they just shrug their shoulders and walk away. If their reaction to that isn't that they just scream and are like, ah, get it away from me or something, well they're not they're not phobic. And you, because you accuse them of being phobic, you now have to experience extreme terror. Like uh, if you had to stand there and there was like a tiger on some sort of chain and he could run up to you and get really close to you, you would just have to be put in scary situations where it's like, no, the thing that you accuse someone else of, you are now subject to. So don't go around making those kind of accusations. That could probably be expanded into larger concepts than just that. That's an idea. So anyone who accuses someone of being phobic, getting placed in front of a tiger 
that is on a chain. Or they could like be dangled over top of alligators or something. Um, I don't have anything like clever for this, but there's no trans kids stuff. Like that's not a thing. If people want to mess around with their gender identities as adults, I guess that's up to them. People get to have their own opinions about it if they do. But that's not a thing for kids. And lastly, I have there's no vaccine coercion. So we believe in a little something called the Nuremberg Code in my manifesto. The Nuremberg Code relates specifically to medical experimentation, which is applicable in the last three years. Um, but beyond that, there's just, there's no coercion, no medical coercion. Well, I was gonna say, maybe if there's like a pedophile, you um, chemically castrate them or something, but we deal with things through either reform or execution or Australia. So uh, that's my manifesto. There's obviously elements of it that are a little bit hyperbolic, but I think there's something in it that is way healthier than, uh, than what we are currently living in and living under. You could say it's utopian. You could say it's not realistic. So is liberalism. So is democracy. All of this is not going to work. What we're doing is not working. So why not live in the trees like Ewoks and reset your technology every hundred years? 